Hey everyone, welcome. Gloria Steinem said far too many people are looking for the right person instead of trying to be the right person. My guest today is Dr. David Rico. He's a renowned psychotherapist. He's author of 20 books and he's been working in this field for 50 years and still practicing. He is a beautiful human being. You're gonna love this conversation. His work emphasizes the benefits of mindfulness, loving kindness, and personal growth. And in this episode, we are going to discuss the book that I have just loved, which is How to Be an Adult in Relationships. We're going to talk about the five A's, attention, acceptance, affection, appreciation, and allowing, and how they are the key to true intimacy. So we're going to be chatting about this and more. Leave us a rating and I'd love to have a review about what you thought about this conversation. And here is Dr. Dave Rico. Thanks so much for joining us. I think your work's just fantastic. Thank you. I really enjoy it. Um, my husband and I are working through the book together right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. We're approaching it really mindfully and very slowly with big pauses and just making sure we're we're attempting not to bring what we might have done before we read your book to what we share so that we can create some new levels of intimacy we've been married for 28 years wow. so congratulations yeah thank you so and I don't think this is natural to people necessarily. I think there's enough layers of debris piled on top of us over the years that whatever part of our spirit or our soul had access to this early can get buried. And what I love about your book is how you invite the spiritual journey as well as the therapeutic journey, the mindfulness journey. Can you speak a little bit about how it came about that you bring both to it? Because I'm loving it and it's it's a beautiful unfolding for us. Oh, thank you. I think uh, the way it began for me was uh, finding Buddhism in about 1971. And the first uh, connection I had with Buddhism was reading a book called um, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Trungpa Rinpoche. And that book was published by Shambhala, which became my publisher. And the book was about how Buddhism is a kind of psychology. And so my first introduction to something that was spiritual in a new way you know, different from the um, Christian view, um, included the psychological. So I thought to myself, well, then this is what I want. It's to bring together how we become healthier according to Psychology 101 and how we, at the same time, advance on our spiritual journey. And that's the journey toward being a person of integrity and love. And so that's the origin of my book, How to Be an Adult in Relationships. And how did the, let's speak to the five A's because I think that's clearly very central to the book. Actually, before we get to that, to me, please help me here. To me, the book is inviting us that where we might have gone outside for the answers or hope to be rescued outside of ourselves, that in those moments of needing to feel that we need to be rescued or in the moments where we feel most wounded or we want to blame or we want to push it away from us, they're the moments you're inviting us to say that's, that's where you get to grow the most. If you can turn that reflection inwards mindfully that that's where you can become an adult in the relationship. And that's the pathway to intimacy. That's a difficult message, Dave, on a bad day and an easier message on a good day. <laughs> it's all over. What's that? 
it's a tall order. It is a tall order. Can you speak a little to our audience about that journey? Because I think it's so integral to the message in the book, the invitation to reflect within in those moments when we would want to push it away from us. It's basically becoming aware of our needs first and then our fears of having our needs fulfilled. And I know that sounds contradictory, but it's the irony that informs so many relationships. We look like we're really wanting intimacy, but at the same time, we could be fearing that same intimacy because of what it entails, which is becoming vulnerable letting ourselves be seen as we really are with all our warts and wounds. And at the same time, um, what you just said uh, figures in so much that um, we would look inside for the first take on what our needs are about rather than immediately going out and seeking. Instead, we're asking ourselves, what were our original needs? And these are the, what I call the five A's. And then how am I disappointed that they weren't fulfilled originally by my parents? We're asking ourselves, how were my original needs fulfilled by my parents or not? And am I simply looking for a partner to make up for what was missing? Because then that would be using somebody to step in and help us evade the actual work we need to do on ourselves. And that work would be to grieve what we missed out on or to appreciate what we did receive. And most of all, to have learned how to give ourselves the fulfillment of these five specific needs that I identified. And these five needs I call the five A's since the words all begin with A. Yeah. And it begins with how right at the beginning of life, we needed 24 seven attention. Somebody had to be attentive to our nonverbal cries for whatever our particular um, material need was. For instance, I need to be fed, I need to be changed, I need to be held. And when our parents tuned in on our needs and greeted them in a fulfilling way and even a pleased way, we began the wonderful human process of learning to trust that I have been born into a world in which you can trust that you will be attended to and that your needs can be fulfilled. And of course, at the beginning, that's 100% of the time. But when we become adults, we realize that it kind of goes down to about 25% from any one person. Otherwise, we're being too needy. So then, um, since one of these needs was to be held, that's our second need, is the need for physical affection. And now we even know that the brain doesn't form fully in the womb. Our, brain, our, our brains develop in accord with how much we're held. So that's the second need is affection which of course later in life could be confused with sex. 
and it can include sex and hopefully will, but um, it's not supposed to be a substitute for it. Then we started to show the particular personality characteristics that we were born with. And we needed acceptance of us as we are rather than have who we are be greeted by people who thought we should be what they wanted us to be rather than what we actually were. So that's a very central one. Um, to be accepted instead of um, having somebody try to form us into what we should be. Or have someone tolerate us. Yeah, or just tolerate rather than welcome us. Yeah. And that's a good word to use. Like we're, was our personality given hospitality in the home? Or was, was it holding us? space for us? Holding space for it as opposed to uh, there's something wrong with you and you know you wind up feeling shame. Then of course, um, we wanted to get it that we were valued and appreciated now that, they, now that they know who we are. They valued us, so that's the fourth A, appreciation. When we started to show any form of independence, including independent locomotion, I'll give an example. They were very happy with that. And they not only welcomed it, but encouraged it. And that's called allowing. They were allowing us to launch out and live in accord with our own choices. So it happened first when we crawled across the floor instead of needing to be carried across. And they were okay with that. They didn't swoop us up and say, I'll carry you across. You don't have to crawl. They allowed us to go. And then they allowed us to go to school and then they allowed us to have our own opinions and then they allowed us to leave home altogether. It's all part of the launching experience and that I call allowing. And the opposite of allowing is controlling. So the opposite of attention is ignoring you. The opposite of affection is a cold distance. The opposite of acceptance is rejection. The opposite of appreciation is taking for granted. And the opposite of allowing is controlling. Thank you. And so if you didn't receive these five A's, you would now not be blaming your parents for being inadequate. You would simply be grieving that it didn't happen. That's the healthy path out of childhood into adulthood. And you'd be saying, those five A's, which I instinctively knew I needed, though I didn't know the names of them, just my whole body knew that this is what was coming to me as a human. When that didn't happen, we will lament the loss and we will um, not try to get it from somebody else but first learn to give it to ourselves. So I wanna give myself those five A's. When I have come through childhood, having grieved what was missing or appreciated what was there and learned to give it to myself and reduced my expectation of what other adults will give me, parenthesis, they won't give me 100%, they'll give me 25% at the most, and that's sufficient. When all that happens, I'm ready for a relationship. Imagine not knowing this. Imagine thinking that, oh, I'm ready as soon as I feel like I'm in love. That's being ready. Well, my book tries to show that's not being ready. Being ready is becoming an adult first. Then you can have an adult relationship. 
one, one in which there is love, but there's also, but the two people who are loving each other are coming from work that they've done to ready themselves for relating. And my other book is specifically on that topic. It's called um, When the Past is Present. Title says it all. Yes, it does. I mean, if, the, if your unfinished business with your parents is sitting between you and your partner, uh, you could never have true intimacy. One of the things you say in the book, and I'll, I'll make sure I get it right, the commitment to work through problems as they arise is the only sign that we truly want full intimacy. Yeah. I love when you make a commitment to work things out with each other, to keep agreements with each other, to do your own personal work, to get you to be the best partner you can be, that's how you know that you have a real commitment, not the re wedding ring. Or the big day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the wedding ring is supposed to represent that. You also talk about how the only issues that we treat matter-of-factly are those where we don't have an emotional hook or a wound from our past. It's one of the things you speak about. And then you suggest this model, the C model, could you chat with our audience a little bit about what that is and how that can be helpful for us having recognition of how we are playing our part in the drama that might be unfolding before us? You mean when the when you have a conflict with the other person? Yeah, or they might be just blaming them or might just be resentment. It, it doesn't necessarily have them having to say anything. There can be drama without their even knowing. Yes. Um, first of all, the drama thrives on um, adrenaline, whereas the true intimacy thrives on oxytocin. That's our hormone of closeness and, you know, warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah. Um, whereas some people are more drawn to uh, keeping things at a fever pitch and it's always a big drama going on. There's always a big conflict which can't be worked out. And uh, when you're doing that, it, you might ask yourself, do I really want closeness or do I, or would I, am I actually just looking for um, an uproar that will safeguard me from ever having to be vulnerable? And uh, one of my little uh, humorous ways of expressing this is I say, did you ever wonder why the 23rd Psalm, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters, why that would be recited as a funeral, but not at a wedding? Hello? Are we thinking peace and quiet is not what marriage is about? That's only for when you're dead. You get what I mean? <laughs> uh, so for some people, it's like that. I mean, they think that it's real if it's um, painful. And that's what that kind of a conflict is. It's a form of pain. <clears throat> Um, but the other part of this is that uh, when you really love, it's more of a sense of serenity mm -hmm. rather than drama. And we're not used to that because we've seen so many movies in which the high romance is characterized by all kinds of conflicts and difficulties and arguments and expectations and blame and um, we don't get it that we imagine it would be boring if everything were moving along smoothly. I think we also <clears throat> miss the serenity you speak of which I consider intimacy 
when we're still thinking our five needs and five A's have to be fulfilled by that other person. That can become addictive in itself. We keep pursuing these five A's, desperately trying to get them back from the person without awareness. I've done that unconsciously. Yes. And bringing into consciousness, okay, that which I seek, I need to turn within. That's harder, Dave. That's scary. It's so much easier to blame them or to pursue them for it because then I get to surrender the responsibility that comes to looking within. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of us are doing just what you described. And it's, you know, it just it's doesn't work. It's thing treadmill that we can get on. And especially if the other person's doing it with us as well, that they think they've got to latch on to us for their five A's unconsciously. And we're trying to latch on to them. And we're just going to be this sinking ship because neither of us knows yet that providing it for ourselves is the source of strength in the relationship, which means we're going to be able to provide it in a mindful way rather than a desperate, clingy, needy way. Exactly. Mm. Can you speak to the three, um, to SEE? -E? I quite liked that. Um, yeah, I enjoyed that. I, that's been useful in our discussions. I will talk about that. But just before I do, I wanted to give a quotation from a poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a British poet. And this is from his poem, Dejection and Ode these two lines, which summarize what you said before. I may not hope from outward forms to win the passion and the life whose fountains are within. That summarizes the, the idea that you brought up. Yeah. I may yeah. not hope from outward forms, people out there, to gain the wonderful, lively passion that I haven't first found in the resources within myself. Most of us aren't taught to look within. Yeah. Most of us are taught and trained to go outside of ourselves. Oh, yes. I know people who don't have an inner experience of themselves. They don't know how to go within. Yeah. It's all part of the uh, commercial setting of society. Yeah. You know, go out and buy things, go out and get things. I mean, the more you find it within, the less business will there be. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to go on to the C that you mentioned, and it's a very good point. Um, and by the way, my most recent book is called Triggers. I have that, I'm reading it now. How we trigger each other, and I'll go more into detail on C in that book. Yes. Anyway, um, I came up with this um, way of asking yourself, what is getting you so upset or reactive? And I came up with the little acronym SEE, -E, Shadow, Early Life, no, I'm sorry, shadow, ego, early life. So when something happens, you ask yourself three questions when you get upset or something is stuck in your craw, continues to bother you, you don't know why. First, is this, the, did, is what I just encountered in that other, encountered in that other person simply a shadow of my own personality Am I seeing in how that person treated me the way I treat others? So that's what Jung called the shadow, the hidden side of you that you project onto other people. Secondly, is it my big fat ego? And by this, I mean the inflated arrogant ego, not the healthy ego. Uh, that has the inner resources. No, this would be the kind of um, entitled part of us. And 
uh, is that what happened? Has my ego been bruised? Is that why I'm upset? And then third, is this a replay of something from early life? So shadow, is this what I usually do but don't get away with? Ego, has this person dared to uh, threaten my greatness? Or finally, is this something that my parents might have done to me and uh, it's re-traumatizing me now? So when you ask yourself those three questions, they're the alternative to blame, immediately blaming the other person. Say, wait a minute, why am I so upset by this? And let me ask myself first, what part of me has been activated rather than how wrong the other person is? And activation to me, when JP and I find ourselves doing this, we invite ourselves to slow down. Slowing things down really helps get out of the hook. Absolutely. Because drama thrives on speed. Yeah, because emotions come in faster than thinking. Mindfulness right. turns up afterwards. Yes. Yeah. And so what, and then the next part, I wanted to have that flow into, because I was fascinated by your whole chapter in the book on ego and face. So I, I hope I'm not putting you in your spot asking you to remember from this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, this acronym face, so fear, attachment, control, and entitlement. I found that a wonderful way to check in with ourselves. One of the many things I admire about your writing, Dave, is that it's an invitation to explore and self-reflect rather than a bunch of things to go do. It's, it's an invitation for mindfulness to this is how you go within. And I think that's so helpful because people don't know, a lot of people don't know how to turn within. They look within and they feel pain. They look within and they feel tense. They look within and they feel hooked. They look within and they feel hot or the adrenaline. But what you're doing is inviting us to reflect on what can help us heal those wounds and progress into adult intimacy. And one of the ways I feel you do that is through your chapter on ego, which I think was a really big chapter. It wasn't a big in writing, but it was has so many practices to bring us closer to our truer selves and how to recognize when we're hooked in that entitlement. Could you speak a little bit to that? Yes, uh, and when you said face, uh, of course, I got the idea from how the inflated ego part of us, what we call the big ego, um, which isn't big at all, really, um, how it loves to save face. That's its main interest. I have to save face. I have to look good. I can never look vulnerable or humble, or certainly not humbled. And so I took that word face and I thought, I wonder if what like four components of this big, big ego might be. And of course, fear is number one. It's the fear that you won't be acknowledged as you need to be, that uh, the rest of the world won't see how wonderful you are, but it's also the fear that you won't be able to handle not being given the special treatment that you think you deserve. So it seems like it's only a fear that you won't get what you want, but it's also the fear that you won't be able to deal with the ordinary uh, you know, what Ham, Hamlet calls the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So ego begins, it looks big, but it's really very weak. For me, it seems it's the fear of not being lovable or being acceptable. Yeah. Instead of facing that vulnerability. Yeah. Instead we create a, a wall so we never have to deal with the question. Yeah, it's the fear that I don't deserve those five A's. Yeah. And how ironic that here we would be 
covering up the very vulnerability that helps people love us. Yeah. So, it, you know, if it, it becomes perpetual. Yeah, it ultimately is self-harming. So it's fear and then attachment to being right, control, I have to control others and their behavior, and finally entitlement. I'm entitled to special treatment. The ordinary conditions that everybody else has to face don't apply to me. I'm above all that. That's kind of an arrogance to it. And it's this is, it's oh, righteousness this is the part of us other people won't like. Yeah. And the and the dreaded treadmill we get on by being in that space, we're never going to get the very thing we truly crave anyway. Yeah, I think one of the quotations in the book that I've always remembered is um, that I, I, I don't actually remember the actual quote, but I'll give you the idea that my purpose in a relationship is not to gratify my ego or have you gratify my ego. My spiritual purpose is to dispossess myself of ego to gratify our relationship. See what a vast difference there is in those two? If you're with somebody who has to be right and who, who's using the relationship to boost his ego, that's the very opposite of success in intimacy. And if you're with someone who's desperate to be loved, they might put up with that, thinking this is at least someone I can interact with and not realizing the depths of the intimacy that could be available. Yeah. And it can, can't go there because they become trapped in their own loop. And then I'm going to quote the book. I thought this was one of your strongest statements. Uh, ego is one of the most vicious enemies of intimacy. That's really strong language. There, it seems it's a solo act. That when we're in ego, it's a solo act. It doesn't, everybody else is a bit player. They're just supporting acts for our starring role and how we have to bolster ourselves. And I feel so exhausted when I imagine living that way. There's an exhaustion about it, just such weirdness. It's definitely a form of pain. Yeah, yes. You like that. And by the way, it is a have to. You see, the ego you're describing is operates on compulsion. You can't help it. I just have to be right. It's not that I think I am right, it's I have to be. I have to be controlling. I have to get what I'm entitled to. It, it's, it's, I mean, that's how your compassion comes in. You're sorry that somebody is stuck that way. In fact, Joseph Campbell has a really wonderful definition of hell. Hell is being stuck in ego. Hell on earth. Yes. The only place, the only place it does exist. And if somebody's putting effort into the neurology around building up having to be right and not being corrected and not being influenced by someone else, that neurology takes on a life of its own. And I picture that person the day when they face potentially not being right or they realize the facade they built, that this is a house of cards. There could be an ego collapse in this if they become aware inappropriately too quickly, I'm not too sure what the language is, of the facade they've built, the shallowness of what they've built, because it's all exterior surface shallowness that they're building. There's no deep dive to self required. Yeah. Mm. It would be a fear of going into the depths because in those depths, you might find out about your own wounds. And then having to face vulnerability, which is just too much because that's, that's what they've been trying to cover up. 
Let's talk a little bit about ways of navigating through this. I loved every practice you provided in the ego section, all of them. Um, I've started at the beginning, we're just making our way through the practices. But around ego, it was um, transforming the need to be right and transforming justification. There were many other practices and also letting go of blame. If we can find that within us, the ability to slow down, and instead of saying that automatic triggered response, blaming the others, if we can just pause that and swallow that long enough, something else may appear. Can you speak a little bit about some of the practices and how they can help someone get out of this solo act in a relationship and start moving towards adult intimacy? Well, uh, what you just brought up would be a good example, but I do want to point one thing out along these lines. Now I'm more and more clear that this work on the ego is so enormous. It requires a major turnaround in one's entire attitude yeah. toward oneself and others. Yeah. And so we want the kind of practices that help us give the five A's to others. When we have made that a commitment, feel that it's a calling, I want to be attentive, acceptant, affectionate, appreciative, and allowing toward my fellow humans, all of them. That is your most wonderful step out of ego, because ego is the Latin word for I. And it's being stuck in I instead of opening to we. And those five A's bring us to that awareness. So I think that would be a most wonderful practice to engage in. I can feel a tension for this person between, okay, I'm going to give the five A's. And I, to do that, I have to surrender my compulsion. I can feel a real tension would be within that person because the compulsion is going to be automatic and faster. And the five A's in, is very much a conscious, mindful act where we need to slow down. And then it's about trying to work out, well, what is acceptance in this moment? What is appreciation in this moment? Whereas everything else has been automatic and it's just so practiced. So I know exactly how to cut that person down. I know exactly how to get control. Or I know exactly how to manage the situation. There's this whole library of works on how to maintain ego. And this is just seems so fragile and precious in the beginning. And it needs to be flamed and just gently, gently nurtured so it can grow. And I think that beginning phase is going to be a challenge. And it's the time it takes and the repetition and the practice, the daily practice. Well, you've expressed it very beautifully. That's exactly how I would see it. Yeah. And, and I love how you've uh, found so much in the book. Thank you. I have. Um, my first read was, it was like a, a hose coming at me and I could only take a, a, a dribble. <laughs> then the second one, oh, okay, I'm, I'm consuming a little bit more. The third read, I began to reflect in it more of my own mindfulness and now we're going through it and working through the practices. But the first read was, I, I understand cognitively the journeys within, and I believe I've done work within. But to hear so straightforwardly, 75% of your needs can be met by yourself. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's yourself and your um, support system. Yes. Friends, family, work, mm. spirituality, mother nature, and yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, Otherwise, I, you're stuck in ego again. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> I, I find myself needing to slow down more and more the more I appreciate the five A's. Yeah. The stillness, the silence, the pausing, yeah. all of that is what allows this to come through and in. And to flourish. There's no room in the speed for the five A's to flourish. 
or for the self-reflection. Right. Yeah. So one of the things you said about uh, transforming the ego is to let go of blame. In those moments when we want to strike out, and you also talk about the energy around anger. Anger is an easy energy. It's a proactive energy. It's a strong energy. We can feel and tell ourselves we're strong in anger. Can you speak to the flip side of that and what we're searching for as we slow down and what it is we would prefer to seek? You mean regarding anger? Yeah, instead of blame and anger, where can we go to within ourselves? Just we slow down and we tap into what? What you're tapping into is in the very definition of anger. And this is a good topic for us to be ending on. Um, that because it's so misunderstood. Yeah. Um, anger is displeasure at being, per, at what you perceived as being treated unfairly. Yeah. <clears throat> so first of all, if you were treated unfairly, the first reaction is grief. We skip that part. We skip how sad we feel because it makes us too vulnerable. And we switch into the other feature of grief, the healthy feature, which is uh, a, a, a dignified nonviolent way of showing our anger, showing our displeasure at injustice. And uh, instead we engage in abuse. And in the book, I have my chart that shows you the difference between the healthy anger and the dramatic theatrical version of it, which is abusive. And that's where the blame is. That's where violence is. That's where uh, demanding that the other change is. And I have my whole list there of all the ways that we imagine something to be anger when it isn't really, when it's just um, um, our own ego reacting with indignation. And our purpose then <clears throat> is not to work through the anger into reconciliation but rather be stuck in the anger and act in retaliation. And as soon as retaliation enters the relationship, the favorite sport of ego, retaliation, um, all bets are off for intimacy. As long as we're still trying to get back at someone, we can't love that person. Or if we're trying to prove a point or prove our righteousness. Yeah be stuck in proving a point. Yeah. Uh, okay to try to prove a point about politics or yeah. ideas or whatever, no problem. But when you just have to be right to justify yourself, um, there's no room you're doing something different from intimacy. Yeah, there's no room for the other person. The other person gets crowded out by the resentment and by the blame. So where yeah. do we go to instead? How, what would you suggest we shift to within ourselves. If we find ourselves getting hooked in the usual pattern of anger or blame or justification, where, where do we go within instead? It's an actual practice. And in the book where you have that list of, yeah. you know, how to show anger in a healthy way, you would um, make a commitment to show anger that way instead of in the abusive way. But most of all, it's the mindful pause so that I can check into the grief element in the anger. And that's really going to um, make me uh, gentler in how I handle things. If we can appreciate that we're coming from a place of vulnerability and hurt instead of righteousness, half the jobs done within yes and what i'm really doing is too scared to express a hurt i'm too scared to express that i'm grieving right now so instead i'm going to turn on you so i don't have to face how i hurt yeah it makes me look stronger 
Yeah. I wanted to close with uh, one of the ways I think about your book. I love the mythological journey, the hero's journey to redemption. I really do. And I see so strongly those elements in this book by design, I'm sure. The hero spends the first part of the movie or the story conquering the bad guys and searching for treasure and trying to get the guy or whatever it is. It's all external. And then the moment when the hero is truly transformed is they realise it was always within, that that which they sought outside was always within them. To me, I see such a beautiful mythological hero's journey in what you're inviting us to reflect on. Yeah. That's a perfect way to put it. And yes, that's what it's about. Are you still working? Do you still practice as a therapist? Yes, I'm still a psychotherapist and I'm still writing. And um, Wonderful. I'm happy to be able to do what I do. I admire your work so much. Thank you well, so thank you. much that you've come on our show. I know our audience uh, will reflect on this and enjoy this dive so much. The book is How to Be an Adult in Relationships. I'm also reading Triggers. And then I'm moving on to the third book that you mentioned, uh, The Past. Can you remind me? When the Past is Present. When the Past is Present. And, and by the way, that's my email. I mean, that's my website, if anybody is interested in. Yeah, I was going to say, how can we hook into what you do? How do we find you? What's your website? It's uh, DaveRico.com, D-A-V-E-R-I-C-H-O.com. Wonderful. And that also has some um, YouTubes that you may want to watch. Yeah. yeah, I've been watching them in preparation for this. I've been enjoying your work in this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Thank I you. I love your life and energy. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Yeah. I very much appreciate you, Dave. I really Thank Thank you so much. It's been lovely to connect with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.